start with the endocrine chapter and before we get into the details of the endocrine system just talk about the mechanisms of uh, intracellular communication so one type of communications we have we have direct communication and the transmission here is through gap junctions and you know the way i like to explain them is gap junctions like electrical windows that uh, look into each cell uh, and we talked about gap junctions before. Can anyone tell me a cell uh, that has gap junctions? Or which cells have gap junctions that you're aware of? Neuron, neurons and cardiac cells. Uh, car cardiac cells, right? So we talked about uh, cardiac cells having gap junctions, exactly. And they're there to facilitate uh, iron flow, right? Uh, so like potassium, sodium can essentially move from cell to cell and trigger the next impulse or the next depolarization uh, cycle. So that's direct communication. We also have uh, uh, paracrine communications. So paracrine is through uh, extracellular fluid, right? And uh, so any, anyone can tell me an example of uh, paracrine cells. We definitely talked about this in uh, the previous lecture. Uh, help me, are you saying something or I couldn't hear you? Is that T cells? Yeah, so, so good, right? So one example would be, you could just say the immune response, right? The immune so response when the immune, T cell activation. Yeah, exactly. So when you have immune response, right, you have the cytokines and they're attracting other cells to come in. So you have uh, essentially paracrine communication is done through the extracellular fluid. So it cell, cells communicate with other cells through that means, right? Next thing we have autocrine communication. So this one uh, is basically uh, whatever the cell uh, secretes will uh, act on itself, right? To essentially regulate its response. So one example we're gonna talk about today uh, is let's say you have a secretion of uh, epinephrine and it's binding to an alpha-2 receptor. We learned before about alpha-1 receptors. Today, we're going to learn about alpha-2 receptors. So in that setting, if this was epinephrine and it bound to alpha-2 receptor, it's basically going to downregulate uh, its response, right? So it's basically like an inhibitory response. Um, so that will be one example. The next example, we have uh, endocrine communication, right? So endocrine, as you see from the pictures, basically it's moving through the blood. So your hormones, or uh, I should say ligands that are being released by the cells are being carried through the bloodstream, right? Uh, let's talk about endocrine system. Can anyone tell me any hormone that's carried in your bloodstream and acts on the target cells? Uh, you want to say help me? Epinephrine. AB. Yeah, yeah. Or you, you could also have, right, uh, insulin. Adrenaline. Yeah, adrenaline, you could have insulin and other hormones that are carried in uh, um, your bloodstream, right? And then you have the synaptic communication across the synapse. We learn about that in the neuro chapter. Here you have uh, uh, neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine, right? Or you have acetylcholine. In this example, it was epinephrine, which was made by adrenal medulla that's usually secreted in your bloodstream. And then you have norepinephrine, norepi or you have acetylcholine which is secreted by the terminal ends of your neurons and they are essentially communicating across the synapses right so an example would be a neurotransmitter so these are some of the examples of of intracellular communication and then uh, some of the stuff we talked about right so you have uh, hormones that are amino acid derivatives so you have tyroxine right t4 here uh, released by thyroid gland, right? You also have catecholamines. Why are they called uh, catecholamines? Is because they're derivatives of amino acids, usually tyrosine, right? And they have the, the benzene or catechol ring, right? So the benzene catechol ring makes it a catecholamine. And then you have things like the, the tryptophan derivatives. It's also an amino acid, right? Tryptophan. And you have melatonin, right? Which is secreted in the brain. Uh, so those are amino acid derivatives, meaning they're made from amino acids, 20 amino acids, I should say. 
and then you have uh, you have uh, peptide hormones, right? Uh, that are made that are secreted by in your body. You also have lipid derivatives, right? Uh, and these lipid derivatives here, right? They give you some examples about uh, steroid hormones, right? Estrogen, it could be testosterone. The major things about these uh, lipid derivative or hormones is that they they can easily bypass through the lipid bilayer uh, because they're lipid soluble and they exert their effects by actually um, going towards the uh, inside the cell, right? Going towards the nucleus, right? And then acting in the nucleus to basically signal the cellular machinery to activate. So it's going to make more DNA, uh, then uh, RNA, and then messenger RNA to make more proteins. So these hormones can basically bypass the cell membrane because they're lipid soluble. And here just shows you some of the uh, graphic representation of the stuff we talked about, right? Endocrine being, uh, they're going through the blood, right? So you have, let's say, you know, a cell here. This could be, let's say, your uh, um, pancreas, uh, islets of Lingelhans secreting insulin, right? So the insulin is coming to the blood vessel, right? And it's being released. And then it's going to go and it's going to bind to a hormone receptor, could be an insulin receptor, and cause you know, the effects on the target cells, right? But the reason it's exerting its effect is because these cells have insulin receptors where these cells maybe have different receptors. Maybe the, the, these are your cardiac cells, they have the beta receptor. So insulin is not going to work on the beta receptor. It works on uh, the insulin receptor. So it's just one of the example uh, of endocrine. So paracrine, we talked about, this was uh, from cell to cell uh, signaling. Ex examples would be uh, your immune uh, signals, right, that they're communicating uh, could be through cytokines like interleukins, right? So same thing, the cytokines are released, and uh, here are the target receptors, they're going to bind and cause intracellular response. Autocrine, right, I give you an example of uh, cell secreting epinephrine, it's going to bind to alpha-2 receptor, right? This could be epinephrine that's secreted here. Right, it's coming in and it's acting on the cell itself, right? So whatever it secretes is actually acting on the cell itself. And alpha-2 uh, stimulation is basically an inhibitory response in this case, so it will decrease uh, further production, right? So this is some of the example of intracellular communication. Now, uh, this uh, here shows you pretty much... Uh, all the organs in our body that are responsible for endocrine functions, right? So we have hypothalamus, hypothalamus they call it uh, the master regulator, right? Uh, we have the pituitary gland, right? There's anterior pituitary and there's posterior pituitary. We're going to learn about this and the hormones they secrete. We have the pineal gland, right? With melatonin secretion. We have a parathyroid glands. We have the thyroid gland, right? Uh, which is re responsible for some of the calcium uh, reabsorption. Uh, we talked about this earlier in the bones chapter, right? Uh, we talked about the adrenal glands just now, uh, especially the adrenal medulla, which secretes epinephrine, which is carried in the bloodstream. Uh, we're gonna talk about the pancreas extensively today. Here is the pancreas, which secretes uh, your uh, hormones such as insulin, right? And also glucagon. We have the sex hormones, uh, testes, right, testosterone, and ovaries. We have estrogen, which are secreted. So these are also a part of your endocrine system. So this is basically just an overview of all the organs of the endocrine system. And the way they work, right, uh, is essentially once the hormone is secreted, right, depending on what it is, is going to uh, bind to its receptor. The receptor is specific to the hormone. Uh, here they give you an example of G stimulatory um, receptors or G inhibitory, and what the what you need to know is basically they're specific to the receptor, right? Let's say if you have an insulin that's released, it's not going to bind anywhere in the body; it has to bind to a specific receptor for it to exert its effect. Same thing like for epinephrine or norepinephrine, right? Uh, so the moment it binds, depending on if it's G uh, inhibitory or G. Uh, 
uh, stimulatory is going to cause different effects, or I should say secondary messengers in the cell, right? Uh, so as, as the name would suggest, right, if it's a G stimulator, it's going to stimulate the cell, probably increase cyclic AMP, right, increase ATPs uh, in the cell. If it's uh, G inhibitory, it's probably going to reduce cyclic AMP or make more uh, adenosine monophosphate, right? So it will reduce uh, the activity of the cell. Uh, here, uh, we're going to learn uh, about uh, the role of insulin shortly, right, how that works. And some uh, work on the effects uh, by increasing calcium uh, secretions, right? And calcium can further uh, cause uh, release of other neurotransmitters or other uh, um, hormones, right, through the cell, through the exocytosis. Uh, Calcium-mediated exocytosis. We learn also about the calcium role in muscle contraction, for example. Right? Here it shows you, I was talking about an example of a steroid hormone, right? Because it's lipid soluble, right? Let's say it's testosterone or estrogen, it can bypass the lipid bilayer, right? Uh, lipid bilayer being a phospholipid bilayer. And once it goes into the cell, it's gonna you know, exert its effects in the nucleus, right? Through the nuclear pore, it's gonna come inside, bind to the hormone receptor complex on the DNA, will activate specific genes, right? And once those genes are activated, it's gonna make messenger RNA, which is basically gonna be uh, transcribed into proteins, right? And these proteins are gonna be released, uh, and then they're gonna go to the target cell and exert their effects. So whatever um, uh, the target cell uh, response is for that particular um, hormone, that's what the effects are gonna be. We're gonna talk about what those are, but this is just a general overview, right? So first, let's start with the, one of the organs of the endocrine system, the pancreas, right? So we talked about in the GI chapter, right? Uh, pancreas secretes uh, things like, you know, amylase, lipase, protease. And these are your digestive enzyme, right? They come into the small intestine, right? And their role was to break up, you know, proteins, lipids, uh, carbohydrates into monomers, right? But uh, you know, you also know that your pancreas makes insulin, and your pancreas also makes glucagon, right? Uh, the way you want to remember, right? When you have high glucose level, right? So you have elevated glucose, your body's going to secrete insulin. When you have low glucose, or when the glucose is gone, right? Or glucose is gone. It's going to secrete glucagon. So let me ask you this question, right? So we know that amylase lipase are being secreted by the pancreas. Here, they are coming in here, right, into the small intestine. And my question is, when the uh, pancreas, the beta cells, when they make insulin and they make glucagon, is it also the same way it goes into your small intestine? What do you guys think? No. No? Uh, wh where does it go? The liver first. It goes to the liver? So, so let, me, let me rephrase the question. Uh, when your pancreas makes these digestive enzymes, right? Or exocrine enzymes. It goes into your small intestine. But when your body makes this, right? Insulin and glucagon, right? Which are your endocrine hormones, right? Where does it go? Does it go the same the same way? It goes into your small intestine? Tell me you want to stop. Huh? I think it, I, I don't think it would go there, but I don't know where it goes. Uh, okay, so... Uh, to what the, 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 the circulation? It go, so not... It, so, yeah, so where it goes is goes the endocrine, right? What the circulation? Communication, communication with the blood, right? So it does not go to the small intestine. It goes mm -hmm. into your circulation. Goes into your circulation. Right? So 
uh, which is saying, help me, yeah, it could, it could go one way, it could go in through your portal circulation, right, uh, to the lower, but the main, m the major distinction being is this, endocrine, right, hormones are being uh, transported by blood, by the circulation, so it goes into your bloodstream, right, where the exocrine function, right, the ex exocrine enzymes, like amylase lipase, proteases, uh, they are being secreted directly into, uh, let's say, uh, duodenum, right, into the small intestine uh, for it to exert its exocrine functions, right, break down or chop up carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, right? So good. So here it shows you the inside of the pancreas specifically, it shows you the beta cells, which are found inside, right? So all these are the beta cells. The function of these beta cells is to produce insulin. And then you have these alpha cells on the periphery, right, on the outside. And alpha cell function is to produce glucagon, right? Uh, the uh, delta cells here we're going to talk about shortly, right? They produce somatostatin, and somatostatin job is to is basically like an inhibitory response, and they're scattered like on the peripheral uh, portions. And inside of this, right, we have capillaries, right? So the uh, these capillaries basically take these hormones into the blood circulation. That This is the distinction, right? So the endocrine uh, hormones are uptaken by the capillaries, right? And they circulate through the body. And then once they reach their target organs, they're going to right work either on insulin receptors or glucagon receptors uh, and exert their effects, right? Uh, so what you want to remember, right? Insulin is secreted when the glucose is high, high glucose concentration. And glucagon is when the glucose is gone. So glucose is gone, glucagon. Uh, we also, right, uh, in uh, in the setting of a person who has low blood sugar, right, we have glucagon in our uh, formulary, right? We give medication, glucagon, which essentially you will see it, it's a powder drug, and then you reconstitute it with some uh, water to mix it. And then in the setting of uh, hypoglycemia, and you were still unable to get IV access, you could give this drug intramuscular. Hopefully that glucagon is going to mobilize liver stores to secrete uh, or break up the glycogen stores and release glucose into the bloodstream. Okay. Uh, so this is just a close-up picture um, showing you that, right? And this is what I was uh, explaining, right? So the digestive functions of the enzymes are going to be secreted directly into the small intestines, right? The duodenum here, right? And your uh, endocrine function, essentially the hormones, right? Insulin and glucagon, right? Are going to be picked up by the capillaries and taken into the blood, right? So this is what we see shown here. This is just a microscop microscopic picture of the uh, pancreatic islet cells of the Langerhans. It shows you the alpha cells, right? The beta cells and the, the basically functions in the endocrine right regulation of your glucose. Uh, so this is uh, a chart that shows you basically how, you know, when, when the specific hormones are released, right, and the basically body's response. So here we see, right, uh, we have increasing glucose level. So they say blood glucose is increasing. So that could be after you, you ate a heavy meal, right, you uh, ate some sugar, right, you ate some protein, um, you ate some fats, so big meal. Uh, and that's what triggers the body, right, to uh, go to the pancreas. And remember I said in the pancreas there were specific uh, glucose transport receptors, GLUT receptors. I think we talked about that earlier. There's glucose transporters type 2. And their job is basically, it's like a two-way transporter. That's why the name, right? So it's constantly sensing the, the environment right around the pancreas the interstitial fluid and it's uh checking how much sugar right there is so if there is high sugar you just ate pancreas senses that with the glut two transporters it's going to say okay uh beta cells uh we need to start making insulin right so insulin is start to be produced and as the insulin comes out right through the blood uh it's going to go to the specific tissues right? Uh, and anyone remember what are specific tissues where insulin 
can work on? Muscle. Muscle, what else? Uh, brain. So brain, so brain in brain is never under the mercy of insulin. If we had to have insulin. It's a glucose, it's not insulin. Yeah, yeah, so, so in, insulin is, uh, is never gonna be there. So mu muscle, right, and something else. So the other one is fat or adipose tissue. And the reason why is that they have the glucose type 4 transporters, which are activated by insulin. Right? So this is where insulin will bind and it will allow the uptake of sugar by these cells, right? So then there is increased uh, rate of glucose transport to those cells, right? Uh, there is more ATP generation, it makes sense. It's going to drive glycolysis. Insulin is one of those. Uh, hormones that drives glycolysis forward to make much more ATP. Uh, we're also going to, because we have a lot of glucose coming in, we're going to make more glycogen for storage in case we have to call upon it in, you know, when we have an emergency. Uh, or it also is going to increase amino acid absorption. Obviously, you just ate your meal. So it's going to, again, uh, store uh, the excess uh, of that uh, in the liver. And also, right, it's going to increase the fat synthesis of adipose tissue so basically think of it like this you are in a hot high fat state uh, and all the excess uh, proteins uh, carbohydrates and fats uh, under the influence of insulin are going to be deposited right and stored later on when you are in fact uh, under low glucose conditions and you need to call upon those reserves to basically sustain life right so here Right, uh, this is what's going on. Now, let, let, let's go on the other side. Let's say you are you have a decreasing blood glucose level, right? So hypoglycemia, right? So hypoglycemia, you have a drop of glucose. We said the pancreas has glucose type two transporters, right? So it's sensing the environment and it's saying, okay, the sugar is low, right? So is it is it time to secrete insulin, right? No, because sugar is low. Uh, time to secrete uh, glucagon because glucose is gone, right? Glucose is gone. So it's going to secrete glucagon. And hopefully, if you had those uh, glycogen stores, which are roughly uh, only good for about 24 hours or maybe slightly longer. So 24 hours, if you have those... Uh, glycogen stores, right? Uh, glucagon is going to work on those glycogen stores, specifically in the liver, right? Uh, and uh, hopefully it will break them up, chop them up, make it into glucose, right? And this will uh, send this into the bloodstream, right? Sometimes though, uh, you may have conditions where there's not enough glycogen, right? Uh, let's say uh, you have someone who is not really eating properly, right? Especially uh, you have those who, uh, you know, consume alcohol, uh, you know, uh, alcoholics, they may not be eating well, but they're consuming alcohol quite frequently. So they may have very low liver concentrations of glycogen. So then the body says, you know, we still want to live, right? So then it starts breaking uh, a muscle, right? Muscle, skeletal muscle into amino acids, right? But uh, it also, by breaking down muscles, you could you also release, right, uh, lactate. So you have lactic acidosis developing secondary to that. Uh, you have increased breakdown of fatty acids, right? And if this continues for a prolonged time, you're also going to start to make ketone, ketones, right? And ketones are very acidic, right? This is one of the problems in the setting of DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, you make a lot of ketones, they're very acidic, right? And this is the reason why you go into uh, di diabetic ketoacidosis, right? The ketones is what is making the, it acidic, uh, right? Uh, and, right, the liver can break out glycogen here. So hopefully, hopefully, right, you had those glycogen stores, right? Uh, that the liver was able to release those glycogen stores as glucose, hopefully, uh, you had, you know, your uh, adipose breaking down, right? But you didn't get to the uh, ketone acidosis yet, right? And your muscle 
uh, was breaking down amino acids. Hopefully, right, you didn't degrade everything. And this will restore to the normal balance, right, uh, if you have the, enough storage here. So this is essentially the homeostasis, right, uh, what happens in your body when you have high sugar and sugar triggers it for storage. You have low sugar, right, triggers it into uh, the breakdown. So this is the function of the insulin and glucagon. Any questions about this uh, mechanism? So if there's no questions, right, we're going to go forward. I will also explain uh, some things uh, with regards to uh, your patients who have diabetes, right? So as I was saying, uh, these cells, right, the, the beta cells were the insulin-producing cells. So in a setting of type 1 uh, diabetes, diabetes mellitus, right, uh, what happens is you have autoantibodies that are attacking these B cells. So basically the body has marked these B cells, right, as non-self. So it's thinking that these B cells is not part of the normal body's response or no normal body cells. So it, it, it targets these with uh, antibodies that will destroy these B cells. So if you have destructions of these B cells, right, you could obviously understand that if their function is to produce insulin, type 1 diabetics, right, will not be able to make sufficient insulin uh, or, you know, make none at all, right? Uh, and that's the problem, right? So that's type 1 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, just to give you a contrast, in type 2 diabetics, they do make insulin, but the problem is that the insulin receptors, right, that where the insulin binds to, they're not as effective. They, they're less effective to that insulin so they either need more insulin to be secreted right or they need additional medications or they need uh, synthetic insulin to be given to them because the receptors on the periphery have lost that uh, affinity and they're not functioning as well right so this is the major problem in diabetes it has to deal with the beta cells right uh, the alpha cells as i said they produce glucagon and uh, the delta cells, right, which we talked about, the somatostatin. So these, this hormone, the somatostatin hormone, is basically like a negative uh, uh, regulator. It triggers uh, the cells to basically stop production of insulin, stop production of glucagon, and other hormones, right? So it's, it's basically like a negative feedback uh, hormone, stops further production. So the other important factor is these hormones are going to be uptaking by the bloodstream so that what makes it uh, endocrine response right is going to communicate through these capillaries that are found in between your cell the islands of Lingerhand cells right and you see right how the the blood flow from the center to the periphery so the blood flow here right flows from the center to the periphery and the goal of this is to basically to uptake those hormones and distribute them into the bloodstream right so that it can flow throughout the body this is your pancreas, right? And uh, right, this was the function of the exocrine uh, for your digestive functions, right? This is just uh, shows you a better picture of the capillary network. Uh, it's highly um, vascular in the center, and then it goes out right uh, to the periphery, and we see all these vessels that basically going to uptake these hormones. Right, and take and transport them to your target tissues. Uh, now, something else I want to talk about, right? So, uh, in when you have high blood glucose level, we talked about that they're gonna send the excess, right, glucose, excess proteins, and excess fat for storage. That storage is gonna take place in the liver. It's going to take storage in the muscle, right? Uh, and in adipocytes, right? For the times when you need to call upon the reserves, right? But you notice here, right? Uh, on this, on the left side picture, right? It, when, the blood, when there's low blood glucose, we are basically sending uh, these uh, chemicals in order for the liver to start sending glucose back into the bloodstream. 
right? But you notice they don't show muscle here sending glucose into the bloodstream. Even though here, right, it does have uptake of glucose into the muscle, storage is glycogen, right? So my question is how come, how come muscle, right, is not shown here? How come muscle cannot give uh, glucose into the bloodstream when we need to call upon it? So it seems it seems logical, right? If it, if you have high blood glucose, right, and then uh, pancreas releases insulin, you store it in in the liver, you store it in the muscle tissue, right, for the time when you need to break it apart. But how come in this picture, right, on the left hand side where it's low blood glucose, right, uh, we have glucagon that's coming in, right, and you have the counter regulatory hormones like epinephrine, which is gonna uh, cause right the liver. Uh, to secrete the glycogen stores. How come muscle is not shown here? What do you guys think? Does each cell use it for itself? Uh, so, so it does use it for itself, but you know, uh, but there's something else, right? There's something else about the muscle that's very specific that it, it cannot uh, send glucose right into your bloodstream so muscle cannot do this and there's a reason for it because the shape of the muscle cell itself the spindle shape of the muscle uh, not because of the shape the shape of the muscle has no impact on that there's something else so the something else is this muscles can break up uh, glycogen to glucose 6 phosphate but they don't have an enzyme to transform this molecule into glucose so they need glucose 6 phosphatase enzyme and muscles do not have it and this is the main reason right when you are in the setting of uh diabetes right and your body does not have insulin the muscles cannot provide further glucose into your bloodstream. What muscles can do is they st start to break themselves up and releasing amino acids. So they can release amino acids into the bloodstream. And the other thing they release is they re release lactate. Right? And they cannot break down the glycogen stores into glucose. And reason for this is that they only can break down glycogen to glucose 6-phosphate and then they're missing that key enzyme, right? Glucose 6-phosphatase that will... Uh, break this down uh, so that that becomes important right so uh, the next thing we're going to talk about uh, here right just exactly how you know we, we know high glucose is going to uh, send insulin into your bloodstream so here it shows you insulin how it goes into your bloodstream right in order to uh, drive glucose into the cell especially in your adipose and fat cells uh, and muscle cells uh, but exactly how it's being released, right? How How is glucose being released? So the way, uh, sorry, how is insulin being released specifically? So the way it's done, right? Uh, this here, it shows you a, a pancreatic cell. Uh, this is here is your beta cell. And the beta cell is, um, is what makes insulin, right? So we talked about the the pancreatic cell has glucose type 2 transporters because they always have to sense right the is the glucose high or low in the environment because it has to know right should i secrete insulin should i secrete glucagon it has to know which one to secrete so it senses okay there is high glucose in the uh, interstitial space in the blood right so it's going to uptake the glucose inside and then this glucose we talked about the process of glycolysis right it goes into the mitochondria and the whole purpose of glycolysis and then sending it the it into mitochondria was to make a lot of ATP, right? And that's what we're doing. So the moment you make a lot of ATP, right, in your cells, and the mitochondria starts to basically uh, release that ATP, the cell is now at high energy supply. And what happens is it's saying, okay, I, there's a lot of glucose that's coming in. We are making a lot of ATP. There's boatload of ATP that mitochondria is producing. And what this does is this ATP binds to ATP sensitive, right, 
uh, potassium channels. So these are a ATP gated channels. I remember Irene asked me about, uh, you know, were, were, were they voltage gated channels in the myocytes uh, um, or they were ATP sensitive channels in the myocytes. So the myocytes had voltage gated channels, but here we see ATP gated channels. So when we have a lot of ATP coming in, what this ATP does is basically it closes this potassium leaky channel. So no potassium can leak out the moment you have high amounts of ATP. And the moment you cannot have potassium leaving the cell, right? And we said cells are usually bags of potassium in the sea of sodium. This high amount of potassium is going to basically make the cell more positive. It's going to take it to the uh, threshold potential, right? And this threshold potential is going to cause depolarization of these calcium channels. And then you have a lot of calcium coming in from the extracellular space inside. And here, calcium, right, is going to cause exocytosis of the insulin. So basically, this is how you have insulin released into the bloodstream, right? This is how the cells of the pancreas know to release insulin into the blood, right? So the whole process was uh, glucose comes in with glucose type 2 transporters, right? Uh, it's going to send into glycolysis cycle in a mitochondria, and mitochondria is going to produce a lot of ATP. This ATP goes to the ATP-sensitive potassium channels. It basically stops the efflux of potassium. No more potassium can leave the cell. And if there's no more potassium leaving the cell, it's going to take the resting state to a more positive state, causing depolarization. The moment this occurs, we have calcium channels that open. They're voltage-gated, and more calcium comes in. This calcium triggers exocytosis of these vesicles, and these vesicles contain insulin. Right? So this insulin basically is released right through exocrine, sorry, endocrine release. So endocrine release is what basically goes into the bloodstream. And then from the, from the bloodstream, it goes to the target organs. Especially your you know, muscle cells right, and your adipose cells. So muscle and your adipose. And that's where, right, you have the glucose type 4 transporters. So that's basically the insulin release. Uh, here you see, right, once the insulin comes and attaches to the receptor, right, so here we have the insulin receptor. And here they're showing us just... Uh, um, any type of uh, insulin cell that has the insulin receptor. This could be your muscle cell. This could be your fat cell. The point being, right, is that it has the insulin receptor, and inside the cell, right, we have glucose type 4 transporters, and once the insulin binds, it sends the intracellular messengers, and these glucose type 4 transporters are going to be expressed on the cell surface, so you'll have a lot of these glucose type 4 receptors on the surface, and this will allow now glucose to come inside the cell. And the cell can basically utilize the glucose. So this is what happens normally uh, on anyone who does not have any uh, pathology, right? No disease process. Um, once they eat a meal that has a lot of glucose, this is essentially the function of these hormones, right? So here we see, again, just uh, the type of cell and the hormones they produce, right? So alpha cell glucagon and beta cell makes insulin. So insulin, when it's stored right in this in these vesicles here, right, it's not your active insulin. It, they call it um, uh, pre-pro insulin. And uh, once the storage of this comes to the vesicle and it's released, it's broken down to its final form of being insulin, which is the functional form. But when it's stored, right, it still is not like functional per se. It's pre-pro-insulin. It's going to be digested. And then once it's in the bloodstream, only then it's going to be an, an effective form. And this we talked about, right, this was the hormone of inhibition. Right? So, uh, right, so you guys learn uh, 
in your classes about right diabetes, which I just talked about diabetes type one, diabetes type two, right? And you know, in the setting of uh, diabetes, right? One problem they may have is called diabetic retinopathy, right? So those small vessels that they, they go to your retina, right, are, are becoming destroyed. So let's say this is your blood supply, right? And here you have your nerves, right, which are sensing, right? And they're being destroyed. So the blood supply, and especially these small vessels, right, they're being destroyed. And you have diabetic, uh, uh, sorry, uh, diabetic neuropathy. This is the diabetic neuropathy. And diabetic nephropathy is the same destruction on the kidney. Kidney small vessel. destruction and why do you suppose uh this occurs why do you suppose uh the patients who have diabetes either type 1 or type 2 they suffer from this diabetic retinopathy where they have small vessels for the retina that are being destroyed they have diabetic nephropathy where the kidneys right the small vessels in the kidneys are being destroyed and they have diabetic neuropathy Right where the small vessels supplying the nerves are being destroyed. I'm guessing the uh, the acidic environment in the body. Uh, uh, the acidic environment. Uh, so imagine, imagine uh, you have a you have a diabetic patient who is complying with his medicines. Let's say he doesn't have an acidic environment. He's he doesn't have diabetic ketoacidosis. He doesn't have uh, any type of pathology just yet. All he has is diabetes type one. He's compliant with his medications, right? Insulin, he takes insulin, but still, right? Still, regardless of his compliance with the medicines, he, he's getting all these features, right? Diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. From the change in the blood sugars, like going from up to down, it's, it destroys the vessels. Uh, the actual constant you're saying the actual concentration of sugar like uh, let's say he's he one, one day he has let's say blood sugar what 200 then he takes his medication let's say it becomes 120 the next day is like again 2 220 he didn't take it is that what you're saying that's causing that uh kind of it's more like like a dynamic change like even when you give insulin it still takes time to work it's not perfect so you're gonna have times where it's 240 and then it goes back down and that destroys the blood vessels. Okay. Anyone, anyone else has any alternate uh, um, ideas or thoughts as to why these patients develop this uh, problems? Increased sugar level at the at the retina and the peripheral nerves and increase the, like inflammation process, mm -hmm. which which destroys the nerves and destroys the retina. Okay, so help me. You basically saying what I think Aaron was saying. You're saying uh, basically high high amounts of sugar in the bloodstream is going to cause these uh, effects on the small vessels. Um, uh, the the other name for small vessel destruction is like microangiopathy, right? Microangiopathy destruction of the small vessels. So, so uh, before right, uh, and before I give you the answer, any any other alternate? Uh, uh, is, ideas. is it this? Is it the same reason that dextrose causes uh, necrosis? Uh, so it's it's so I can tell you it's not because of uh, it's not because specifically of the high sugar content in their blood. So this okay. is not occurring because of the high sugar content. Right. So any other uh, thoughts? So before, right, the, you know, what doctors believed, right, they said, you know, diabetes uh, type 1, we know that there is auto uh, antibody destruction against the beta cells of the islets of the Lingerhans, so it destroys the insulin. So the doctors figured, right, the moment we give the patient insulin, it should solve all their problems, right? The moment you give them insulin, the insulin now affects, uh, acts on the target cells, sugar is being uptaken, right, into the body, but still, even when they give the insulin and if the patient was super compliant meaning they 
followed the regimen. They did not miss any uh, insulin shots, right? They were still developing this diabetic uh, retinopathy, right, where they have destruction of the small vessels to the retina. They developed this uh, nephropathy, destruction of the small vessels to the kidney, and they also developed this uh, neuropathy, right, destruction of vessels that supply your uh, nerves, right? So, and they were puzzled, like, what's going on? So then they recently they discovered, right, what was causing it. So when you have pro, pre-pro-insulin, remember how I was saying your insulin is stored in these vesicles here, right, before the release, right? So you have this insulin that's stored here. Before it's released, it's not in the active form. So before it's released, is the form is inactive. It has this sequence of, uh, it's called the signal peptide sequence. It has the alpha chain, right? It has the beta chain, so beta chain and the alpha chain. And then it has the C peptide. The active insulin is, is only this beta chain and alpha chain. So once it's released, this is the only active insulin. And before it's released, th these this sig signal sequence is chopped up, and this signal se this C peptide is chopped up. It's chopped up and it's released, right? So in your bloodstream, if you wanted to measure someone's uh, uh, how much insulin they are producing, right? You could measure basically their C peptide level. You could measure their uh, active insulin level, right? And you could see how much of this is being released, right? So this just shows you, right? When it's in before it's in active form, right? This is your uh, pro insulin stage, right? Where you have the C peptide, alpha chain, beta chain. It's going to basically come out the vesicle, right? Through the Golgi. It's going to chop it up, right? As you see here. And then you have this and this form released. So what is this form? This form is your alpha chain and uh, your beta chain. This is your active insulin. And this is your C peptide. And what the doctors discovered is this C peptide, right? Is what uh, uh, basically secretes, right? Something known as uh, nitric oxide uh with this enzyme and nitric oxide what it does is it keeps the endothelial cells of your small vessels uh dilated right especially the enzyme right that makes nitric oxide so the c peptide is basically what's doing that and it also this c peptide it was allowing your sodium potassium ATPases to function so they later they discovered basically that it was this c peptide uh, that was responsible for the small vessel destruction in the diabetics because as you know in type 1 diabetes they don't make insulin right so if they don't make insulin they cannot secrete right all this stuff here and there's no c peptide so if there's no c peptide if you just give them insulin right yeah you will drive the sugar into the blood cells uh, uh sorry you will drive sugar into the adipose and muscle cells but there's no c peptide that will counteract the destruction of the small vessels so later on, they basically, they, they said there is a uh, emergent, emerging uh, therapy where they basically give uh, patients C-peptide, right, replacement therapy. And this basically prevents the diabetic uh, vasculopathy or destruction of these small vessels, right, which we see, right, in retinopathy, nephropathy, right, and neuropathy. So this is what they were giving. And uh, what the C-peptide does, it basically allows your sodium-potassium pump to work, right, which we talked about before. And it also produces this nitric oxide synthase. This enzyme basically allows you to make active nitric oxide. So this is why we see this destruction. Even if they're complying with their insulin, right, they still have this microangiopathy or uh, the you know this retinopathy uh, um, effect, right? Nephropathy, neuropathy. So basically, this is what what it is. And uh, this is the function, right? Even if they're super compliant with their medication, this is why the patients who have diabetes still suffer from all these uh, increased risk effects, right? Of heart, of coronary blood problems, circulation problems, endothelial problems, and the nervous system problems. And this is the reason why, right? When I say, uh, when we were talking about in the cardiovascular chapter, especially patients who have atypical presentation, diabetics would be one of those patients. And, it's, and if, if they complain atypical symptoms like you know, GI discomfort or anything like that, uh, you want to be cautious, you want to do a 12 lead EKG because, right, they may have uh, nephropathy, they may have uh, destruction to the nerves, they may not be sensing it as well. Uh, and 
they may be having a STEMI, you just, you know, they're not describing the chest pain signs and symptoms. So C-peptide is what essentially was responsible uh, to keep those vessels healthy by secreting this nitric oxide and diabetics do not make that. Right. So Nick, you say that they can, they can make this into a drug and give yeah. it to diabetics. Yeah. So so this this is the, the, there are studies now that show basically synthetic forms of this, right? Where they start to give it to the patients, right? Uh, it's called C-peptide replacement therapy, and the the they discovered discovered that this is what prevents this uh, uh, prevents this microangiopathy or prevents this diabetic vasculopathy, which is destruction of the small vessels, specifically in the retina, which is called retinopathy, specifically nephropathy in your kidneys, and neuropathy, which is destruction of the vessels to the uh, nerves, right? So yeah, they give them synthetic C-peptide, which was showing to improve all these things.